Today I want to talk about 10 things that you need to know about a rhinoplasty before you get that procedure done. Number one, how many different types of rhinoplasty are available? In basic, there are two types of rhinoplasties. One is closed rhinoplasty and the other one is open rhinoplasty. Closed rhinoplasty is for minor procedures like uh, if you have a little hump or uh, the tip is droopy, we can make a small incision inside the nose and remove the hump and refine the tip area. This procedure has limitation. You cannot put graft or restructuring the nose in terms of functionality as much as you can do with open rhinoplasty. Open rhinoplasty is the standard for rhinoplasty. If you want to do a comprehensive rhinoplasty or revision rhinoplasty and a structural rhinoplasty, then open rhinoplasty is the best. It's like fixing a car. Either you can fix it without lifting the hood and the mechanic has to be able to fix the engine without looking at anything, or the open rhinoplasty is opening the hood and just exactly see where things are and adjusting it accordingly. Basically, open rhinoplasty, there is a small incision here and the rest are inside the nose. Uh, then we lift the flap and then remove the hump, narrow the bone, refine the tip, and also any structural issues inside the nose, we're able to fix it. Some people ask me, what are different between rhinoplasty, which is cosmetic rhinoplasty, septoplasty, septorhinoplasty. Cosmetic rhinoplasty is just working on the shape of the nose, whether it is a large hump, a dorsal hump, bulbous tip, white no nasal bone, or white nostril. In some cases, uh, like Asian American or African American, they have subtle nose and they want to have more prominent and better uh, nasal features. Uh, so those are cosmetic rhinoplasty. Some people have issues with the breathing and the outside may not be as uh, bad as what's going on on the inside. And that's called functional rhinoplasty meaning we just correct the internal portion of the nose and uh, do septoplasty and spreader graft to make the function of the nose better. And there is septorhinoplasty, which is combination of making the nose prettier and also make the breathing a lot better. So this is a challenging and is not for every surgeon. Please, you have to be highly specialized in rhinoplasty and septorhinoplasty. Meaning, not only are you making the nose smaller, you're trying to make the airway huge. So, it requires uh, grafting and making the outside smaller, but then making the internal portion of the nose well function. So, septorhinoplasty, I compare it to having a Ferrari that you, not only you want to fix the body makes it look good, but also you want to make the engine works fully functional. So that's a lot more challenging just having somebody just do the body work and or septoplasty somebody who just works the, on the engine, but the person who does septorhinoplasty can fix the whole car, make it run beautifully as fast as it goes and also looks good. Recovery for rhinoplasty are, I divide them by three segments. One is immediate, intermediate, and long-term. The immediate one is like you're having the surgery the first week. Okay, you got a cast going on here, your, inside your nose is, you may have a splint. We don't pack it anymore, but there might be a splint and congestion and you can't breathe to your nose nose and you feel you breathe into your mouth. There is no pain involved, however. Even it looks some bruise maybe around the eyes, rarely, but some people get bruised and look scary to some people, but it's not painful. But there is a discomfort involved. So after a week, when you come back to our office, 
uh, we, we take the cast off. And oh, by the way, the sutures are all dissolvable. Even the sutures here, we don't need to take any sutures out. So the only thing we need to take the cast off and I clean inside the nose. Obviously, I spray some numbing medication inside the nose and I will uh, suction or use a special instrument to grab the dry blood and mucus from inside the nose so you can uh, start breathing again and people feel amazing right after because there's so much air start going through their nose. So that uh, finishes the immediate portion. The intermediate portion is uh, now you want to go back to social life, back to work, school and so forth. So uh, initially, you don't want to do heavy duty exercises like running um, or biking for first couple weeks. Obviously no boxing or uh, karate and exercises like that. There's contact sports or even playing soccer or basketball for at least a uh, month, month and a half because your nose is still not fully healed and you don't want to have a damage to the nasal structure. After a month, I would say about 85% of swelling has subsided and there's another 15% of swelling uh, in the nasal area that requires a year and that's a long term. It's not visible to anyone, only you and your surgeons know there is a swelling there. There's a little numbness going on here, the tip is still a little hard, and that softens and further refine the tip and the nasal structure, and makes a great nose to an excellent looking nose in a year. Answer is yes. There are surgeons who do rhinoplasty, breast augmentation, liposuction, all kinds of surgeries, and also they do rhinoplasty. But there are surgeons who specialize in face and rhinoplasty. And those are facial plastic surgeons, and there are some that sub-specialize in nasal surgery as well. Basically, those surgeons are the ones dedicated their education, their learning, and also teaching other surgeons to do rhinoplasty. My practice is mainly facial rejuvenation and rhinoplasty, including primary, revision, and ethnic rhinoplasty, teenage rhinoplasty as well. Actually, rhinoplasty, as it seems very brutal by looking at some bruises that some people may have, it doesn't hurt at all. Most of my patients take Tylenol. At most, they may take a little bit of painkiller the first night, but mostly is uh, the discomfort they're dealing with, the nasal congestion, not be able to breathe at night because your nose gets stuffy and you breathe through your mouth and your mouth gets dry but there is no pain, excruciating pain, that people associate with rhinoplasty. It's basically mild discomfort, but a lot of nasal congestion. And the answer is no. I've been doing rhinoplasty for over 15 years, and I have never packed the nose. And the reason for that, that's an old school way of uh, uh, controlling the bleeding. With the advances in rhinoplasty and how delicate, delicately we uh, deal with the tissue, uh, I do not need to put any packing inside the nose. However, uh, they're all called internal nasal splints. Some people who have severely deviated nasal septum that I need to remove the deviated septum and put the septum in the midline again. We have very tiny little splints that are uh, silastic and soft, I put them inside the nose between uh, the, so the septum is in between and I suture it and uh, that keeps the septum in the center and then in a week I remove those. But the old school way they had like this long gauze that they pack it inside the nose and the experience of people that had it like my mom or grandmas or some of your friends who, who had it in the past or still some 
uh, older doctors who use old school way of doing it. It just basically pulling that packing inside the nose gives such a difficulty and pain that patients for the rest of their life remember that. Not anything else about rhinoplasty but that packing. So I don't do it. Some ask me if rhinoplasty is a perfect operation and the answer is no. The whole concept of rhinoplasty is to bring harmony and subtlety to the facial features so that your nose is not standing out in the middle of your face with imperfection. So basically we're trying to harmonize your nose with the rest of your face. So the face that uh, the nose that looks good on Kim Kardashian may not look like on somebody else. There is no perfection. No, if you look at different celebrities, none of them have perfect facial features. So if they're not perfect, don't expect perfection. And if you want perfection, you're not a candidate for rhinoplasty. If you want improvement, you're a great candidate. So a lot of kids during their growth uh, see some changes in their nose and facial features that they start uh, feeling insecure about it and they request to have improvement. So when they reach age of 15 and 17, uh, they're becoming a good candidate and they can have the refinement in their face so they, when they go to high school and finishing high school going to uh, college, uh, at least they're not distracted by the imperfection of their nose. There are some people who wake up a little late in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even seen people in their 60s, they come and say, well, you know what, I don't like my nose. And they are also a great candidate. So there is no perfect age, let's say. You have to be at least 15 to 17 to start. But I've done uh, rhinoplasty on uh, the oldest I've done was actually 65 for cosmetic rhinoplasty. The nose is made of three main components. There's bone, there's cartilage, and there is skin, like an envelope covering the whole thing. In some cases, the cartilages inside the nose are not well performed, like internal nasal valves. There are two uh, nasal uh, cartilages here, and there are muscle attached to it on the side of your face that when you breathe, these open up the more air goes in. In some cases, those valves are narrowed or collapsed. Either injury, sports injury, car accident, you name it, childhood injury. So the internal valves are collapsed and the individual is unable to breathe. So what we do, pieces and put it inside the valve to make the internal portion of the valve open, wide open, while outside is not affected. So those are during the rhinoplasty and septorhinoplasty I perform. In some cases, uh, if there is not enough uh, cartilage inside the nose, I take a look, make a small incision inside the crease behind the ear and take a portion of the cartilage and shape it to the cartilage I need and use that. Knowing that this cartilage is not very firm, it's only great for when you want to work on the tip area because of the shape of the ear cartilage and also it's softer. But if you want a hardy and firm cartilage, either we get it from septum or sometimes we get it from the red area. The best cartilage that I think is without making an incision here and cutting the bone and painful rip harvesting, I use cadaver cartilage and they're very safe. I can restructure the nasal shape. Sometimes uh, the result of rhinoplasty is not as, is not as what it was intended uh, for patients. Either it's a surgeon's fault or the healing process. Nasal surgery or rhinoplasty is the most complex 
uh, surgeries in plastic surgery. The reason why you have a small little structure in the middle of face that composed of three different structures, bone, cartilage, and the skin. And each one of them heal in a different rate. And they may not heal in the same way. And slight scarring in one of these tissue causes the misshape of the nose and not having the satisfactory resolve for the patient or the surgeon. So there are solutions. It's called revision rhinoplasty. And there are some surgeons who specialize in revision rhinoplasty. So I do quite a bit of revision rhinoplasty in my practice. And uh, it's not the surgeon fault sometimes. They, they come to me and say, okay, everything was fine. After a year, my nose starts becoming crooked or the tips start dropping. Well, that's the healing process. Some people immediately after their surgery have issue and that's mostly the surgeon's inability to perform the right surgery for that individual. But most of the time, sometimes a healing process uh, takes a toll and creates an unwanted uh, nasal structure that the patient was hoping not to have. I do open uh, revision rhinoplasty by making a small incision in the uh, columella, we call it, and the rest inside, and lift the skin up and uh, work on the structure, put special grafts. And this is more challenging than rhinoplasty. This procedure, revision rhinoplasty, I would say by far the most complex surgery in all plastic surgery procedures. So the goal of ethnic rhinoplasty is to create a nose that fits that person individually and ethnicity without changing their ethnicity. So we don't want to have a Caucasian nose on an Asian or African American individual. That would look odd and bizarre and it doesn't fit that person. And uh, anybody who sees that individual in the street, they know, okay, well, there's something here that doesn't look right. So the goal of ethnic rhinoplasty basically is to create a harmonious and soft look to that individual to look uh, better for their race and ethnicity. For instance, African American, uh, they have different needs, they have wider nostrils and low riding the bridges called saddle and they have wide nasal bones that require different type of surgeries to create, to build up the nose. So we use cartilages from uh, their septum or even getting uh, ca cadaver cartilages to build up the uh, nasal walls and bring them higher up to create more lifting of the tip so the nose is not too flat here. So we lift up the tip and we also narrow the nostrils. So Asian uh, ethnic rhinoplasty is different from African American. Even they have similar features such as low dorsum or saddle nose, wide nostrils, uh, and also uh, columella is not projected or the tip is not projected enough. However, what looks good on Asian is different from what it looks on good on African American. So most of my patients who have Asian background, so they want a sharper dorsum here and tip to be more projected and refine the tip area more and obviously reducing the uh, alar area or nostril. Middle Eastern such as Persian, Arabic and Mediterranean knows that mostly is nasal hook and they have huge dorsum and also the tip is hook and droopy. That's different type of procedures uh, that requires to create a rhinoplasty for those ethnicity to give them stronger or let's say stronger features rather than creating a scoop nose that is not going to fit them. Teenagers come to my practice with their parents. Obviously parents are super nervous because uh, they don't want their kids to have surgery. I totally understand it. I'm a parent and it's scary for me to hear my child is going to go have surgery. 
but uh, the child uh, or the teenager who has some imperfection in their nose because of the parents' uh, ethnicity or some sort of injuries uh, during uh, uh, sport activity, they get crooked nose or uh, due to ethnicity, they get a big hump or white nose and they don't like it because they get uh, very cruel comments in school and also affects their confidence and they can't carry on and they're very sensitive to their look and teenagers, if you have one, you know how sensitive they are about their little things that uh, affect their confidence. If the teenager is past 15 for girls and the boy is past 17, which face is fully has grown, they are candidates for teenage rhinoplasty. Obviously, they have to be mature uh, emotionally uh, to understand that it requires recovery. The parents need to do their homework, find a surgeon who specializes in teenage rhinoplasty, understanding the children, and their needs and how to communicate with them. Look at the surgeons before and after pictures, galleries, and see if they have done hundreds of teenagers. So the, not only the teenager, but also the parents feel confident that the results are gonna be something that is gonna be suitable for that teenager. And another thing is a lot of teenagers come to me and they show me a nose that is desirable because it's cool right now but I always remind them, someday you're gonna be a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old, and the nose that you think is cool is too scooped up and the tip is a little raised up may not look so cool when you're in, their four, in your 40s or 50s. So it has to be a nose that fits your structure right now because you're gonna carry that nose for the rest of your life. Can I regret having a rhinoplasty done and why? When you're going for a rhinoplasty and talking to your surgeon and you don't have any clear idea of what is right for your facial features and you bring a model picture or somebody who has a scoop nose or just too small of a nose and that nose may not fit your facial features and later on you totally regret it then that's something that you have to think about because you're gonna need to have a revision rhinoplasty. So listen to your surgeon, listen to your inner thoughts and don't go by your emotion. Do your research and see uh, what is gonna fit for your face. Don't do too much because too small of a nose or too radical of a nose will bring you regret. Lots of people ask me why there's such a huge range in rhinoplasty prices. One doctor gives me such a low price and then you and other surgeons have gone and they have a little higher price. What is it? The answer is first you're looking at the skill that surgeon has. If he's specializing or he or she in facial surgery, especially rhinoplasty, they dedicate their whole practice to that procedure or facial surgery. So obviously they're more specialized. So the price is gonna be higher versus a surgeon who does rhinoplasty, breast augmentation, tummy tuck, liposuction, everything else. Obviously rhinoplasty is a small portion of their uh, practice. The example is you go to Target or Marshall and you can get a handbag for $50 and then you go to Gucci or Hermes and then you may need to pay $20,000 for the bag that you want. So it depends what you want and who's doing it for you in terms of rhinoplasty and that makes a huge difference. If you want a successful rhinoplasty, the result that you're looking for, you need to go to someone who specializes in rhinoplasty.